handful of scenes in the Godfather trilogy that hold so many secrets within, that all these years later, we're still able to uncover countless hidden gems with depths of meaning. And if there was one scene worth exploring, one scene that encapsulates the power dynamics in the game of power, concealed deep within layers of subtlety and mysterious undertones, it would without a doubt be this very scene. What shocked me is that like you, even after watching this scene countless times, we've only managed to scratch the surface. Remember, even though this is a fictional meeting that's based on real life events, this meeting is brilliantly crafted to reflect the realities of the game of power, with all its subtleties and sibylline mysteries hidden deep within. And this scene is the key where everything changes. And to be honest with you, when I set out on this journey to truly understand this concept, I was overwhelmed. So I decided to make a mini-series that will unveil all these secrets, simplifying what is in actuality a labyrinth of secrets and intricacies that are only known by the top echelons of the players in the game of power. We'll dive deep into this world, delving into the minds of the top players in this game, and give you all the tools and lessons needed for you to become a master, no longer the victim, avoiding having to pay the price of those who didn't heed our warnings. This is what sets the Godfather trilogy apart from any other film series. We don't have much time. In part one, we'll be laying all the intricate preparations that were made to set up such a colossal meeting, as well as introducing all the key players. Are you with me? Good. Let's get started. Once you arrange a meeting, that's the five pounds. Santino Corleone's death shook up the underworld big time. But guess what? Don Corleone didn't just stay in bed. He got back in the game, took charge of the family, and seemed fully recovered at the funeral. The other families got wind of this and freaked out, scrambling to brace themselves for the revenge war they knew was coming. No one was dumb enough to think that Don Corleone could be underestimated just because he had some setbacks. The Don sent messengers to the five families, not just for peace, but to set up a big meeting with all the families in the city. He even invited families from all over the US to join, because whatever happened to them affected the whole country. At first, people were suspicious. Was Don Corleone preparing a trap, trying to catch his enemies off guard, maybe setting up a big revenge plan for his son? You know, have them all in one place and then let all hell break loose, bread wedding style. But the Don made it clear he was serious. He got all the families in the country involved, didn't gear up his own people for a war or ask for allies. And then, to prove he was genuine, he took the final irrevocable step that established the authenticity of these intentions and assured the safety of the Grand Council to be assembled. He called on the services of the Bocchicchio family. Meet the Bocchicchios, a mafia clan originally hailing from southern Sicily, but later making their mark in America, settling in the Hudson Valley near New York City. They started out as mediators for other families, particularly those who had faced hardships under Benito Mussolini's rule in Italy. Despite not being known for their intelligence, the Bocchicchios stood out for their unyielding family bonds. They took the Sicilian concept of vendetta to the extreme, earning a reputation even among mafia circles for their fanatical commitment. If any harm befell a member of the Bocchicchio family, they'd stop at nothing to seek revenge, displaying an unrelenting pursuit that was impervious to bribery, threats, or even armed protection. This vengeful nature became a lucrative business for them. They offered a hostage service to more influential families, becoming a crucial player in negotiations or sit-downs between different mafia clans. When families wanted to demonstrate sincerity during such meetings, they'd pay a hefty fee to the Bocchicchios for one or more hostages. The deal was simple. As long as the negotiator returned safely, the hostage would be released. However, if violence erupted and the negotiator was killed, the Bocchicchios would redirect their vengeance not towards the hostage takers, but to the family responsible for the negotiator's death. A Bocchicchio never lied, never committed an act of treachery. Such behavior was too complicated. So now, when Don Corleone enlisted the Bocchicchios as negotiators and organized the provisions of hostages for all the families attending the peace summit, there was absolute certainty about his sincerity. There was no room for doubt or suspicion of betrayal. The meeting was as secure as a wedding. 
with the hostages delivered. The gathering was to be held in the boardroom of a commercial bank. The bank's president owed a debt to Don Corleone, and some of its stock was under Don Corleone's ownership, albeit registered in the president's name. The meeting was set on a Saturday afternoon, where the executive suite of the bank, the conference room with its deep leather chairs and its absolute privacy, was made available to the families. Security at the bank was taken over by a small army of hand-picked men wearing bank guard uniforms. Soon, the conference room started filling up. Alongside the five families of New York, there were envoys from ten other families across the country, with the exception of Chicago, the outlier in their realm. They had given up on trying to reform Chicago, deeming them untamable mad dogs unfit for inclusion in this crucial conference. Each conference representative was allowed one aide. Since most dons had brought their consigliere as aides, the room had relatively few young men. Tom Hagen was among those few, as well as the only non-Sicilian, making him a subject of curiosity, a standout among the guests. So let's begin introducing all the key players in attendance. One of the first to arrive was Carlo Tramonti, who had established the southern United States as his turf. It was Tramonti who established connections with Cuba and the Batista regime, channeling money into the pleasure havens of Havana to entice gamblers from the American mainland. Today, Tremonti was a multi-millionaire, the proud owner of one of the most opulent hotels in Miami Beach. The second to arrive was Don Joseph Zalucchi from Detroit. The Zalucchi family, cleverly operating under various disguises and covers, had a stake in a horse racing track in the Detroit area and also controlled a significant portion of the gambling scene. Zalucchi himself was a round-faced, friendly-looking man residing in a $100,000 home in the upscale Gross Point neighborhood of Detroit. One of his sons had even married into an esteemed, long-established American family. Similar to Don Corleone, Zalucchi possessed a refined taste. Detroit boasted the lowest occurrence of physical violence among the cities under family control. Additionally, Zalucchi strongly disapproved of the involvement in drug trafficking. Accompanied by his consigliere, both men approached Don Corleone for warm embraces. Zalucchi spoke with a booming American voice, only a hint of an accent discernible, radiating hearty goodwill. Addressing Don Corleone, he remarked, Only your voice could have brought me here. Don Corleone nodded in gratitude, confident in Zalucchi's support. The subsequent pair of Dons to make an entrance hailed from the West Coast, arriving together in the same car as they often collaborated closely. Frank Falcone and Anthony Molinari were the names. Frank Falcone, in particular, controlled a lot of the movie unions and gambling operations. Anthony Molinari had a firm grip on the San Francisco waterfront and stood at the forefront of the sports gambling empire. Hailing from a lineage of Italian fishermen, he took pride in owning the finest seafood restaurant in San Francisco. Legend had it that he might have incurred losses in the venture due to his commitment to offering exceptional value for the prices charged. The representatives of the five families of New York were the last to arrive. There was Anthony Stracci, who controlled the New Jersey area and the shipping on the west side docks of Manhattan. He ran the gambling in Jersey and was very strong with the Democratic political machine. He had a fleet of freight hauling trucks that made him a fortune, primarily because his trucks could travel with a heavy overload and not be stopped and fined by highway freight inspectors. These trucks helped ruin the highways, which would later be fixed by his road-building firm. Gotta admit, it's a pretty impressive racket. It was the kind of operation that would warm any man's heart, business of itself creating more business. Stracci, too, was old-fashioned and never dealt in prostitution, but because his business was on the waterfront, it was impossible for him to not be involved in the drug smuggling traffic. Of the five New York families opposing the Corleones, his was the least powerful, but the most well-disposed. Next, we have Don Otilio Cuneo, the patriarch of the family that holds sway over Upper New York State. This formidable figure orchestrates the smuggling of Italian immigrants from Canada, controls all upstate gambling, and wields veto power over state licensing of racetracks. His legitimate business ventures included ownership of one of the major milk companies. Don Cuneo was known for his kindness towards children, always carrying a pocket full of sweets in the hopes of delighting one of his many grandchildren or the small offspring of his associates. Remarkably, Don Cuneo is among the few Dons who have never been arrested, and his true activities remain shrouded in secrecy. His public image is so impeccable that he has served on civic committees and earned the prestigious title of Businessman of the Year for the State of New York by the Chamber of Commerce. Then we have the enigmatic Don Emilio Barzini. 
Barzini carried himself as a very courteous and gentleman-like figure. He was known as a very eloquent and charismatic man. After all, we are not communists. But hidden very well behind all the witty remarks and socializing was a shrewd, cunning man capable of the worst kinds of treachery and ruthlessness. Barzini was calculated, a true strategist, resorting to more prudent and Machiavellian tactics rather than reckless barbarism, all of which he had acquired from early on. You see, before establishing his own family, Barzini had been Don Giuseppe Mariposa, the former boss of bosses in the criminal underworld. Now what happened there was quite the mess. <laughs> Full of treachery, betrayal, and highlights, the outright ruthlessness of that world, this was the period known as the Olive Oil War. But it's essentially the war that revolutionized the criminal underworld, the one that propelled Barzini to the top. Don Barzini wielded influence across various domains, with stakes in gambling, in Brooklyn and Queens, strong arm operations, complete control over Staten Island, and involvement in sports betting in the Bronx and Westchester. He had a hand in narcotics, maintained close connections to Cleveland and the West Coast, and displayed keen interest in the open cities of Nevada, Las Vegas, and Reno to Miami Beach and Cuba. His influence even stretched back to Sicily, and rumors hinted at a potential presence in Wall Street, making his empire one of the strongest, second only to the Corleone family in New York, and consequently the entire country. Don Barzini had been a staunch supporter of the Tattaglia family since the beginning of the war. His ambitious goal was to surpass Don Corleone as the most powerful and respected mafia leader in the country, with aspirations to assume control over part of the Corleone empire. Unlike the old-school mustache Pete's, Don Barzini embodied a more modern, sophisticated, and business-like approach. His confidence and support from the newer, younger leaders on the rise set him apart. While lacking Don Corleone's warmth, Barzini exuded great personal force in a cold manner making him, perhaps at this very moment, the most respected man in the assembled group. The last to arrive was Don Philip Tattaglia, head of the Tattaglia family, which had directly challenged the Corleone power by supporting Solozzo and had so nearly succeeded. Despite his significant role, there lingered a slight contempt among the others. It was widely known that Tattaglia allowed himself to be dominated by Solozzo, led astray by the cunning Turk. He bore the blame for the chaos that disrupted the everyday business of the New York families. Tatalia earned disapproval for his personal indulgences. The Tatalia family specialized in the vice trade, primarily prostitution, and held control over the most nightclubs in the United States. Tatalia didn't shy away from strong-arm tactics to gain control. Tatalia's personality grated on his peers. He was a chronic complainer, lamenting the costs associated with his family business. His laundry bills, which were seemingly excessive, ate into his profits, though he conveniently owned the laundry firm. His loudest complaints were reserved for authorities who held power over liquor licenses for his nightclubs, claiming he had made more millionaires than Wall Street with the money he paid those guardians of official seals. Philip Tatalia did not possess the same traits or even the same level of strategic prowess or even intelligence that the other dons possessed. He compensated for his lack of intelligence by surrounding himself by far more capable and strong leaders, primarily his two sons, Bruno and John. Despite his almost victorious war against the Corleone family, Tatalia hadn't earned the respect he believed he deserved. His strength had derived first from Solozzo and then from the Barzini family. The fact that with the element of surprise, he hadn't achieved complete victory worked against him. If he had been more efficient, the entire conflict might have been avoided and the death of Don Corleone would have marked the end of the war. As he entered and made eye contact with Don Corleone, they acknowledged each other's presence with a formal nod. The attention of the other men shifted to Don Corleone, studying him for any mark of weakness left by his wounds and defeat in their war. Now with this scene set, and you understand all the hidden context and stakes involved, we'll be diving straight into analyzing the meeting itself, unveiling all of it. The main point of this miniseries is to extrapolate it into real life. This meeting is brilliantly crafted to reflect the realities of the game of power, with all its subtleties and sibylline mysteries hidden deep within. Be on the lookout for episode two, so make sure to check the description for something really special and watch this video next.